This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Brain attacks and brain injuries. We talk concussions and strokes with neurologist Dr. Terry Neal on this edition of Conversations. There has been much talk recently about brain injuries or concussions. Most of the attention focusing on the suicides and premature deaths of several NFL football players. Many believe these untimely deaths can be linked to repeated head injuries these players may have suffered over their careers. But what might be most frightening is the potential brain injuries our children may suffer while playing youth sports. We'll discuss how to best protect them. Another concern of brain health is stroke. According to the National Stroke Association, nearly 800,000 Americans suffer strokes on an annual basis. The good news? The association says nearly 80% of those are preventable. Dr. Terry Neal is a neurologist and medical director at Sacred Heart Regional Stroke Center in Pensacola, Florida. Dr. Neal has trained at the University of Alabama, Birmingham and the University of California, San Francisco. He specializes in stroke and traumatic brain injury. We welcome Dr. Terry Neal to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. There has been so much talk recently in the media about the National Football League, big lawsuit players suing the NFL, Junior Seau recently committed suicide. All of it comes back to they think players may be having concussions throughout their career and is causing bad things to happen. Before we get into that, first and foremost, what is a concussion? Well, uh, a concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. So we've all heard of the unfortunate severe car accidents where someone has a severe traumatic brain injury. This is a obviously much milder version of that, but unfortunately it's an injury to the brain that uh, the brain usually regains function fairly quickly, but is a mild injury to the brain that can even persist longer than that. When you say it recovers quickly, what, what time frame does it usually take? Well, it can vary. You can, uh, you know, anywhere from seconds to minutes that someone may feel back to their normal self, but it may take hours, days, even occasionally weeks that they really get back their true brain functioning to where they can go back to what they were doing before physically and um, socially. What kind of hit typically causes a concussion? There's many different types, but um, it can be any type of hit to where either to the skull directly mm -hmm. or just a movement, a sudden movement of the head that could obviously uh, change the motion of the brain to where it contacts the skull and causing the neurologic symptoms that happen. So like if you were in a car wreck and is it possible the, the brain actually moves around within the skull? Is that what you're saying? Or? The sudden movement of the uh, skull itself. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be a direct blow to the skull. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that often where someone may have fallen to the ground, but they didn't strike their head. And then they have uh, brief symptoms and then sometimes symptoms that are under-recognized. Okay. Going back to the issue that's in the NFL, what, what do you make of that? Well, I think uh, obviously with uh, some of the more high-profile athletes over time, whether they be Troy Aikman, Muhammad Ali, they have obvious uh, injuries to where they've had to stop their sport or they've had permanent neurologic injuries. And as that notoriety has occurred, we've seen that uh, these uh, concussions are more severe than what we thought, and especially in patients or athletes that have more repeated concussions. Yeah. Now, I've read that, that what the real issue may be with some of these guys is the cumulative effect. It, it kind of expand on, on what that means. Well, um, it, the cumulative effect is that even though it doesn't appear like there's brain injury, if you did a brain scan or you did an, an examination on a patient, that they have some type of injury to the brain such that the next concussion, maybe the second one, maybe it takes the fifth one, unfortunately causes uh, potentially permanent injury uh, some of which is recognized, some of which is not. It's my understanding that a lot of times is what they're finding is is after the athlete has passed away during the autopsy process, what it's a what CTE is that? The well, you can do uh, obviously the autopsy, post mortem examinations, yeah. or even occasionally they'll do some type of brain scanning. Mm -hmm. um, usually, it's more the autopsy, and they'll see changes within the brain that have been occurring for years. Now, and, and this is what I guess they're calling a the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is it? Am I... uh, that's a, a fortunately rare condition, but a condition such that usually not the first event, that can be the first or second event or 
an event to where it's a concussion, but the patient didn't fully recover, such as maybe they were released to physical activity too soon, and the brain has a dramatic swelling or inflammatory type of effect such that there's catastrophic problems. And I guess that's what they're seeing in some of these football players that have passed away. The chronic encephalopathy um, has to do with those cumulative effects, as you mentioned, through repeated blows to the head or repeat, repeated injuries, and maybe they didn't fully recover before they uh, were allowed uh, to go back. Whereas there are certain, certain sudden events that can occur that uh, the patient can do poorly even after the first concussion. So I guess it just kind of depends upon the individual situation and, and perhaps the person. It does. It can. Are, are, are men or women either or more prone to concussions? Well, I think, uh, you know, the young men are often a little bit more adventurous and um, uh, women play sports as well. But some of the, I guess you would say, risk-taking behaviors, um, whether it be driving the way they shouldn't or uh, the high velocity injuries that you can see with some of the sports uh, leave some pr uh, men more prone to have those injuries. But absolutely, as you mentioned, with uh, younger children or some of the uh, sports that women participate in, lacrosse, soccer, volleyball, you definitely see concussions in those groups as well. Are children more likely to get a concussion than adults? Well, they have the, a young brain that's uh, still growing to some, uh, in some respects. Right. But I think it's the same idea in that uh, they can have the same injury that an adult can. They usually can recover a little bit more quickly. It just depends on the severity of the, uh, the incident. I'd read somewhere a lot of it makes, uh, makes a difference on how strong your neck is. Well, that's why there, uh, there's a lot of notoriety with uh, soccer mm -hmm. these days. So uh, there's some notoriety to say, okay, is, there, is heading the ball a problem? Right. Because you have these younger uh, kids that are participating in these sports uh, particularly soccer, maybe even volleyball, mm -hmm. and do they have the neck strength, so to speak, or even the muscular strength in general to be able to absorb that type of um, hit to the head. In your judgment, should kids be heading a soccer ball? Well, I think, um, you know, there's obviously certain techniques that um, the soccer coaches will tell you that you're maybe more prone um, to have an injury than others, but no one really knows that. Mm -hmm. So I think it should be avoided when possible, but it's a game that's always going to have heading. Right. So I think that you look at a certain age, maybe it's eight years old, 10 years old, no one has the exact age to say, let's say that they can be released to heading a ball, but uh, you have to be a little bit more careful depending on the age. Yeah. Going to the football issue again, and, and, and I know this is something that probably concerns a lot of parents as their youngster wants to play football. Mm -hmm. Once again, in your, in your medical judgment, do you have an age that you say, man, I might not let my kid play tackle football until? Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough because, again, uh, certain kids are more physically advanced than others, and uh, some, certain children have more physical um, attributes such that they have the knowledge that they're going to take a hit this way compared to another child who doesn't have experience. So I would not say there's a certain age. I think it's just all in the techniques of the sport and the education that these concussions can occur. And when in doubt, certain activities should be delayed a little bit. Because probably when you and I were coming up, it was kind of the old thing, well, you got your bell rung. <laughs> you exactly. Know, get back in there or whatever. Right. But in today's world, now that we know that this is serious business, what should coaches and parents look for after a kid, quote unquote, gets his bell rung? I think it's an immediate change where you know that there was some type of blow, whether it be a heading event or whether a tackle, and that type of event uh, would leave you more prone to some injury. Obviously, if the child is not uh, acting normally, they should be immediately removed from the field, be assessed on the uh, sidelines, and be held from that activity until uh, definitely they're back to their normal self, but really for the rest of the game, yeah. if there's any doubt that they had any type of injury like that. And, and, and after you know, a week or two or three weeks, should parents, any particular thing they should be looking for? Well, we have what's called, which is fortunately because of all this notoriety, not for good reasons, we have uh, protocols that are called it, uh, graduated protocols to where children, whether it be their social activities or their physical activities, and even, of course, the professional athletes, that they go along these protocols to gradually increase their activity or their even social activities um, to, to see where they may be within that range of getting back to their normal self. 
If you had a situation where either in, you know, Pee Wee or, or high school football or whatever, where a child sustains a concussion, seemingly heals up, and then has another one pretty quick thereafter, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that the brain may not have healed the way that you, you thought it was going to. And while children are resilient, we know that um, they can recover from injuries that you would not expect, that uh, that brain is definitely still prone to have a, a worse injury the next time. And so when in doubt, based on the protocols we've mentioned, that the child should not be released to uh, even basic physical activity until they're, sim until they're symptom free. Yeah. And that even has to do in this day and age with texting or talking on the phone, uh, uh, using computers, that even going to those activities or high level schoolwork, children may have to go very slowly and progress to those things as well before, of course, even the physical activity can occur. Uh, how, how would that affect it? Is it well, the brain, uh, you're obviously challenging the brain and we take it for granted that every day we walk around and we do things, we text, we, we do things that you would not think would, think would stress your brain, but um, that it does in the setting of an acute neurologic injury. And so if a child uh, can't even do basic schoolwork, um, you could imagine to return to physical activity, particularly a contact sport, that's going to be difficult to do and may leave them at risk for a permanent brain injury or a mild injury. You say permanent brain injuries. What are some of the concerns that people should have that have had repeated concussions as far as what may lie in the future? Well, I think everyone's heard of, uh, you know, the obvious things like someone lost consciousness and then they woke up and they were not as sharp as what mm -hmm. they were. Well, you can magnify that even to other activities such as your attention and concentration, your behavior. Um, it can affect sleep, um, your uh, uh, behavioral type skills, um, and then of course there's things like insomnia and walking issues, but I think it's those cognitive issues like attention and concentration and behavior um, uh, that are the biggest things to notice. I've read quite a bit that many of these NFL players have said my memory is just nowhere near what it used to be, and, and we're not talking about their 70 years old, we're talking their, in their 40s. Right. Your, your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely, memory, short-term memory, not usually long-term memory can be part of that. You know, is, is there anything you can do to try to correct that? I mean, if you discover it ahead of time? Is it... Well, I think that, you know, the tendency would be to, to go ahead and get them back in the game, get them back in school as quickly as possible, but it's actually uh, could be contrary. It could be that gradually get them back in schoolwork, basic physical activity very slowly and see how they do. Yeah. You were talking a few minutes ago about, uh, you mentioned Muhammad Ali and, and the repeated head blows obviously as a boxer and I think that he has uh, Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's related to the head injuries? It's directly related to it. So he has a unique form of, of Parkinson's that's related to traumatic brain injury and absolutely as you asked before that was a cumulative effect that was irreversible. So he might have had some kind of tendency to develop that uh, normally, but uh, I think you have to say that that heavily contributed to it. Do you think repeated brain injuries would increase your chance to get, say, Alzheimer's? I think that uh, along with Parkinson's, um, uh, dementia of many different sorts could be related to that, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's being one of those. Interesting. Yeah. I guess that as this the, the positive thing about this in the NFL is it, it is going to focus more research on the on the topic for sure. It definitely will in all sports. You see that in the NHL. You see that in the NBA, um, soccer, of course. Um, in our Academy of Neurology, we have a subsection for sports concussion for sports injury, and uh, as as good as that sounds, that sure it's helped uh, develop protocols and standardize things. I think you saw Colt McCoy was released to a game too early. So right. I think you have to have uh, independent assessment occasionally. Right. And then the players, like it or not, they have to give a little bit of input to say, you know, how do you really feel? And when in doubt, you have to take it out of their hands, which when you have finances involved and yeah. other issues involved, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and particularly when you get down on the high school level, that's when there should be no questions asked because these kids aren't getting paid $3 million a year. No, you, you know, have to so. protect them for the future. Absolutely. When I see um, young kids in clinic, I tell them that, listen, this is for your future, not, in, yeah. not just in sports, right. but uh, for academics in your career. 
Um, and the idea is that if we do this the right way, they can be released later on the way they should and get back to the way that they want to participate. Yeah, yeah. Let me switch gears on you here for a second. I know another area of expertise for you, stroke. Yes. Um, what's a stroke? Well, there's a, a couple types of stroke. Um, there's, there's a number of different types, but the, the biggest categories we think about are ischemic stroke, which is a blockage of an artery that then in turn leads to permanent brain injury or at least mild brain injury. Um, sometimes, if you're fortunate enough, it's transient, and we could talk about that as well. Or a bleeding type stroke called a hemorrhagic stroke, where you have a bursting of a blood vessel that may cause a neurologic injury. What's the difference between that and an aneurysm? An aneurysm has to do with a hemorrhagic or bleeding type stroke, uh, where you have an abnormal uh, artery that usually because of things like high blood pressure, smoking, that through the wear and tear of that artery, it becomes malformed and it bursts and can cause catastrophic brain injury or even death. Which one is worse for you? Well, I think, you know, it depends on the location of the injury. It depends on uh, the, uh, the size of the bleeding, let's say, or the size of the ischemic stroke, what territory of the brain it affects. Uh, fortunately, we have treatments for both, but uh, depending on the type of uh, stroke you may have, then there's some decision making with that. I mentioned off the top of the show that the, um, I guess the uh, Stroke Association says that a great many of strokes are preventable. Sure. Why is that? Well, the basics, and it sounds simplistic, are just the risk factors. So the common risk factors are going to be high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, blockages of carotid arteries in the neck, irregular heartbeats such as atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And if we can prevent or we can control those risk factors, it doesn't prevent all strokes, but it greatly limits not only the severity of the type of stroke you may have, but prevention of some strokes in general. Okay. Take the lifestyle choices away. What would cause, for the other 20% or so, what, what, what would cause that to happen? Is it genetics or? Well, you do have certain situations, like you said, with aneurysms that uh, someone may be prone to form aneurysms. And, Sometimes we do surveillance or pre-testing to look for those things. And um, uh, some people are just born with certain anomalies that they'll never know are gonna happen until unfortunately a catastrophic event happens. Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, it really does come down to those risk factors, some of which you're born with, just because your family has it and doesn't mean you're gonna have the same thing, but right. um, at least you're more aware of it to prevent it. Is there, are there tests that you can run to see if you're a, a possibility that it would affect you? Or? Uh, there's certain genetic tests for certain type of things and then uh, with certain type of brain scans that we can do, you can do uh, basic testing for t things like uh, aneurysms uh, or just at certain age groups, uh, you can do testing to just see if there's a blockage of a carotid artery or or, or those type of things. Is there a rule of thumb like, you know, you you could reach a certain age and they say you should have this test or that test. Shouldn't you do the same when it comes to your brain? Well, I think that everyone in terms of uh, the risk factors are going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, the medications they're on and their genetics as well. So there's no magic age because we see strokes and unfortunately young patients. We see them in patients that have done well, but then they have their first stroke at age 88. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, as simplistic as it is, um, that you want to look at the risk factors and then it, I'd say at least around age 60 or so a carotid assessment is probably a good idea and then it seems crude also but we have to go on the symptoms of the patient although we know that we're going to control those risk factors have they had any recent symptoms that may lead us to further testing what symptoms might alarm you yeah with uh, the, in terms of ischemic stroke we talked about hemorrhagic a little bit but just ischemic um, there's a condition called a TIA. It's a transient ischemic attack. It's a warning sign, sign of a stroke. So um, you want to prevent that, obviously, because if, or you want to look into the symptoms, because if, um, if you don't, it may cause an actual stroke. So if someone has sudden weakness or numbness on one side of the body, so, uh, sudden speech difficulty, sudden vision loss, or sudden balance problems, anything that's sudden, it's never happened before, it's not going away after a reasonable period of time, 10, 15, 30 minutes. That's when you want to seek medical attention sooner than not. And then of course, sometimes headache goes into that as well. So I seek medical attention if I'm having TIAs. What, what do you do at that stage in the game to prevent it from going farther? 
Well, it used to be uh, the old uh, saying, diagnose adios, meaning that uh, they would come with a symptom, then you do basic testing, and then they could go out of the emergency room. But we actually will admit these patients that have the sudden symptoms, admit them to the hospital, do testing, such as MRI scans, carotid ultrasound, um, ultrasounds of the heart, basic blood work, watching their heart monitor, and sometimes other tests as well. And if, you, if it looks like they're leading up to a stroke, what can you do to prevent it? If we think that someone comes in within a certain time period, um, uh, in this day and age it's even up to eight hours, but in particular up to four and a half hours, we can give clot-busting medications. Um, the medication is called TPA, and that is approved up to at least three hours, in some cases four and a half hours, to try to break up the clot when it's administered by an IV. And then at Sacred Heart, we have, uh, fortunately, options to do interventional care, where we go through the groin with a catheter, go up to the brain, and give these same medications or other type medications, um, or do interventional procedures to pull out clots in the brain. Okay. So the, the key is being alert to what's going on with your body. Be aware of the symptoms. Seek medical attention carefully. Don't drive yourself to the hospital. Yeah. Call 911. Get there quickly. And then from there, it's, it's on us. That's our job after that. Yeah. Teleneurology, what is it? Well, it's a, a system that's uh, been around actually for a while. Um, it's a simplistic idea. People get on Skype all the time. They talk to each other. Um, that's been uh, expanded greatly with a number of companies uh, in that uh, there's a rolling computer cart in a remote emergency room. Um, I can do it on a phone or a laptop to where you'll have access to see that patient um, on a website to examine them real time. And so some of these smaller hospitals that don't have a neurologist, they don't have a stroke specialist, uh, we can give them immediate consultation and make recommendations to the hospital to provide certain levels of care to include bring them to our hospital. So it's been a great expansion for our stroke center yeah. in Santa Rosa, Crestview, Destin, now Panama City. Well. What excites you about technology as we look ahead in the medical field? Well, I think the teleneurology is a great example, and you can even expand it going back to concussion on the field. Um, you can expand it to other countries. We can collaborate with other specialists, other colleagues. That's something, to be honest, as simple um, as those things. You can collaborate and treat patients right then and there. So we can come up with fancy MRI scans or other imaging techniques, which Certainly those are exciting and those will get better and expand uh, our field, but I think the networking, so to speak, of not only in our community, but in our region and nationally, to be able to connect those dots yeah. to get people in touch with a specialist or technology to get the best care right then and there, even if it's a small hospital. Uh, it's amazing what technology is doing for us, isn't it? Sure is. It, it really is. I want to come back to something talking about the, the strokes for a second and kind of tie in with, with concussions. I'm, I'm, my memory was jogged. The, the football player, Teddy Bruschi, yes. who played for the New England right. Patriots, mm -hmm. young, healthy, um, had a stroke. He did. Do you think that could have had anything to do with all the hits? I mean, can the two work together? No, if, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with this case, but he had a structural problem wrong with his heart. Okay. And... Um, Sure, the physical activity that he was going through, that probably uh, may, may have tipped him over the edge to lead to the stroke, but it wasn't the concussion per se. Okay. So it was a different uh, if it, different issue that caused the stroke. Okay, so, so we really couldn't tie concussions and strokes together per se. No, okay. no not in his no, case. Very good. Talk a little bit about, I want to go back because I, th I do think this is important and, and more and more medical information comes out and it, it seems that a lot of how our health ends up is really dependent upon us from, from a lifestyle choice. Sure. So I want to give myself the least chance of having a stroke. Lifestyle, what should I be doing? Well, the typical diet that in the South, you know, we have a difficulty uh, or difficulty controlling is just common sense like fruits and vegetables, the way you prepare foods, um, smaller portions over larger portions. So better to eat four meals a day probably than than two meals a day. Right. Um, basic exercise every week, you know, half an hour um, a day, maybe four to five times a week. And then again, I've reinforced it, but all the risk factors that we've talked about already. Like smoking and things Smoking, like that. Uh, excessive alcohol use, um, and then the risk factors with high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes. I, I saw a map 
the, I guess it was a stroke map that there's a certain part of the country that has more strokes than why? We do live in the stroke belt and okay. some of it may have to do with access to medical care, um, some of those uh, more indigent areas, but that's everywhere in the country as well. And then it may come down to things like lifestyle decisions, um, food preparation, our diet, exercise um, abilities, and, and those things may be geographic. Okay, well, that's yeah. kind of interesting. As far as exercise, any particular type of exercise that's better one over the other? I think obviously as we all get older, we try to think we're gonna lift weights the way we did before. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> right. No, it can't happen for me, but right. um, I think the cardio uh, exercise, you know, again, maybe at least a half hour a day, fast walking, um, uh, faster walk, faster running if you can, but yeah. it's just listening to your body and doing what which, which you think you can do. Yeah. Consistency, right? Right, sure. Yeah, I guess is is uh, you don't have to run a marathon. Just, just, no. <laughs> just With, within the individual, whatever they feel like their tolerance is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If someone wants to know a little bit more about number one concussions and also strokes, do you have a website that you would recommend they go to? Uh, the American Heart Association is good for a uh, good basic stroke website, and then the American Academy Academy of Neurology has a concussion subdivision within that that you can pick up a lot of these things. Okay, and will that give coaches and parents kind of an idea of, of procedure on the field? And The Academy website has a very good section on questions and then on education in that way. So it's a great website for uh, coaches, for parents, and for the children themselves. Okay, okay. And then the Sacred Heart Stroke Center, do you have a website with info on that? Um, the Amer the uh, Sacred Heart website itself has a neuroscience division on there, and that's where the stroke website should be. So it's pretty informative as well. Okay. Interesting conversation. We certainly appreciate you spending some time with oh, us. Sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. Dr. Terry Neal, he is the medical director for the Sacred Heart Stroke Center, Sacred Heart Regional Stroke Center, actually. And obviously, he's a neurologist, and we certainly appreciate him spending some time with us today. By the way, if you would like to catch up on some of our past conversations, you can do so at wsre.org slash conversations. And of course, we're on Facebook as well. All you have to do is search out Conversations with Jeff Weeks and you can like us, love us, say hello, whatever you need to do. We'd love to hear from you. I truly hope you enjoyed the broadcast and we greatly appreciate you watching. I'm Jeff Weeks. Take good care of yourself and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.